Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Pay the Way Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Helbeck, and today I am here with uh, a good buddy of mine, Chad King. I would say he's more of a virtual buddy. I think we've met in person once, but uh, we've had many uh, Zoom calls together and some phone calls together. And uh, Chad's a guy who li who's living in Nashville, who's doing some big things in the uh, single family space as well as the multifamily space. So I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into his story today, kind of learn a little bit about Chad, how he got going and what he's doing today. Uh, once again, on the on the flipping space and also on the multi space. So Chad, thanks so much for joining me today, my friend. I really appreciate you being on the show. Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to have the conversation. It's always fun when we get together. Yeah. It's always some 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 great nuggets always come out of our conversation. So I'm excited to talk. For sure, man. All right. So, I mean, obviously, like typical podcast question, I mean, what kind of got you into real estate? I think we've talked about this briefly, but what was really the thing that got you in? Because I think you're, you're still a young dude. You're, you're a couple years older than me, I think. And, uh, you yeah, know, you've been cranking for a while now. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a 30,000 foot yeah. view. I mean, I was working at Xerox out of college. So I was selling copiers door to door. And that's kind of also when I started to, that, that sort of personal development and starting to study and, and choose what you're educating yourself on. That's when I also started down that path because, you know, most people think education ends with, you know, high school, college, but really the real education starts after that. So when I got into sales, I wanted to control my own destiny, control my own income. Now that was the whole idea of, of taking that job with Xerox um, and quickly found out like the corporate ladder is not something I want to spend time climbing. And uh, especially at Xerox, that's a very large ladder to climb. So yeah. um, so I, and during that, during that time I was there for a few years, I was one of the top salesmen at the company. I was doing well. Um, and, and I was studying these successful people and I kept seeing real estate, man. Every successful per person seemed to be involved somehow in real estate, whether it was holdings, it was, they were just, it, it seemed to be this commonality that I kept seeing. And, um, you know, I got to a point, there were some things that happened in my life, but I got to a point where it was just like, all right, I need to commit to, to doing this. And I quit my job. Um, you know, there's a story about me cold calling Grant Cardone and he actually took, took my meeting and I met with him for about 15 minutes. And at the end of the meeting, he told me, he said, I asked him, I said, if, if you were my age, you know, and you're in my position, what would you do? I was 24 at the time. And he said, if I was your age, I would get into real estate and I'd be a billionaire by now. And, you know, when he said that to me as somebody that I had looked up to, and I'm big on be careful who you get your advice from, but oh, yeah, dude. you know, as somebody who I, I really, uh, his advice carried a lot of weight. I was like, all right, that's all I needed to know. And two weeks later, I put in my two week notice at Xerox and just got in. Um, and we can dive into how that went because it was a very, very Let's bumpy it, road. Let's when do it. I think we're, we're, we're going there, man. Let, let, I want to hear this. I think people are going to, I mean, that, that little story with Grant Cardone is, is, is pretty interesting. So let, let, let's yeah. unpack this a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I mean that the, the kind of the moral of my, st the, the whole underlying theme is kind of commit first and then figure it out. Right. And yeah. I was fortunate enough in my life to be in a position where I could do that. Um, I just proposed to my now wife and we were living in a, a place that she had paid off. So we were very fortunate to not have this big mortgage payment or a big rent payment. So I was in, it was like, now's the time to do it if I'm going to do it. Um, so I, I quit, got into it and this was January, 2017. So not too long ago, and, yeah. you know, I'm only three years in, but you'll see kind of a theme in my story is leveraging coaches and mentors to gain more experience and to do more. And uh, anyway, that's, that's me telling you, like, you can get a lot accomplished in three years if you leverage other people and mentors and partnerships versus just trying to figure out all on your own. It can take you 15 years to accumulate the same amount of experiences if you get a coach. But, and that was, that segues into one of my biggest mistakes when I first got started. Number one, I didn't ask Grant the follow-up question, which was, Hey, what would you do first? <laughs> so I just, I just got into it. I got my license. I mean, the first, the first year was brutal. The first nine months really was like, was I was trying a bunch of different things. I mean, and, and a lot of people can resonate with this story. Like I didn't know what to do. Like I just knew I wanted to, I knew I was going to make it work and I knew I was going to figure it out, but I had $10,000 saved up and I was like, that's plenty of money. I'll be fine. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> got my real estate license. I was trying to do like some commercial tenant rep stuff. And oh man, then I tried to do some like real estate photography. It was terrible. I, I did a lot of, I lost a lot of money and I ended up probably six months later. I was in, you know, I was in probably about 25,000, $15,000, $25,000 of, of debt now that I had accumulated on credit cards just to try and continue to finance the business. And 
that was about, that was when I started to figure out the wholesaling too. So I was spending money on the wholesaling for marketing. Oh, and yeah. that was ultimately where I found that niche was the wholesaling. So I was six months into the real estate career. I had done like one wholesale deal. And then the next month I did two. And I was like, man, I really got to figure out how to scale this thing. Cause I was my own bottleneck, right? I was trying to do everything. And when you're trying to do everything, you're really not doing anything. No. And <laughs> yeah, totally. So that's what led me to get involved with um, who I'm with currently, which is Blackjack Real Estate. And I can, I, I found out that I can get into somebody else's vehicle. You don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel. And I think this is going to segue into a point you want to talk about, but you can get into somebody else's vehicle. I would be, I, I'm very cautious about who I'm going to get into the vehicle with because you want to make sure that they're ready to put their foot on the gas and they're going forward as fast as you want to. And, you know, so I was doing one, two, two deals a month and I got into this vehicle where I could leverage my unique ability, which was sales and getting people to sign on the dotted line, which was what I was great at. And they had this machine already built out, which was generating leads and deals. So, you know, I, I, got, I came in and started acquiring properties for them at a high level. And when I met with that, when I, when I got involved with Blackjack, they were in two markets successfully. And you fast forward two years and now we're in five markets. Um, I'm running the wholesale department. We're in five markets. I've hired and trained all the reps in all these markets. They're buying houses for us at a very high level. You know, we'll do just shy of 200 deals this year and um, shooting to do a lot more, a lot more next year. And that's just in a short, short window of, um, you know, just a, just a couple of years with them. Yeah, that, that's phenomenal. And uh, yes, I think people, I mean, that's why I wanted to bring you on because I mean, you have so much experience with, um, you know, being successful in the, in, especially in, obviously in the wholesaling and, and flipping business. We're getting the multifamily stuff later. But like, mm -hmm. what, what do you think like the big issue is with people? I mean, because you obviously, you're a successful wholesaler. You're doing deals every month. How did you end up like, what, what, was, what was your like kind of, uh, how did your decision making process go when you're like, you know what? I could do this myself, right? I can do, you know, the marketing and this, the operations and all that's capital raising, or I could just focus on like just buying houses at a discount off of sellers and doing, like you said, your unique ability. What, what was kind of like your breaking point where you decided like, Hey, maybe it makes sense to do this because people don't realize like if you add a tremendous amount of value in another, you know, in someone else's vehicle, obviously, like you said earlier, you got to make sure you're in the right vehicle. You can make a ton of money and then you're going to save yourself a lot of the stress and overwhelm that you would have had you know, if you're, you know, running the whole show, you know? Yeah, uh, that's a phenomenal question. And it's a point that, um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people can really grasp is the fact that, you know, you don't necessarily need to recreate the wheel. You oh. can partner up with somebody and go further, farther together and faster together. You can go further, faster together than if you were doing it on your own. And what I realized for me was that, um, wholesaling and flipping and you know you're in this space right if you're doing it on your own you're not going to if you're only by yourself and doing it on your own you're not it's not this is not financial freedom you're gonna you're not gonna achieve financial freedom by wholesaling houses on your own no however you know you look at a guy like bill allen who's the owner of blackjack real estate and he has achieved financial freedom from this vehicle but he's built he's built out the entire company so you can you can scale and grow and build a machine that flips and wholesales houses. And that can be your, your, your uh, ticket to, you know, stepping out of the business, but that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And for me, I, I did not want, I was not interested in building that vehicle. I wanted to get into that vehicle to make active income. And then what I do is I make that active income by flipping and wholesaling because it's a phenomenal business to make active uh -huh. income. And I recommend it to anybody to get started to make money, right? But I would caution the listeners when you're getting started in wholesaling and flipping, like know that it's going to be a job in the beginning, right? It's, it's a stressful, not, high paying job. It's a very stressful and it is, it's very high paying, but very, very stressful. And unless you're planning on building a team, that's going to run that for you, you know, you're going to have, and you think you're going to be a passive investor in flipping and wholesaling. That's not the case, right? Until you can build that team out. Um, no. So, so for me, I, I didn't want to build that whole vehicle because I wasn't interested in building a wholesale company myself, but I was interested in the active income that wholesaling and flipping makes because you can make a lot of money if you're good and you know that. Yeah. Right. Fast. You can make a lot of money fast if you're good. Yeah. And, um, 
So I, my decision-making process was, hey, I don't really want to build this vehicle out. We'll talk about multifamily in a little bit, but multifamily was my, always, always has been my goal. Like that's what I want to build out as a portfolio of multifamily, which is much more of a passive investment, oh, right? Yeah. And that's where, that's where wealth and long-term wealth comes into play. Like you're not going to build long-term wealth flipping houses, right? Again, we talked about it. You can build wealth if you build up a passive business that flips houses, but it, you're not going to do it flipping houses yourself. And um, so that was my decision. That's where my head was at with it was like, I'd rather get into this vehicle and make a lot of active income and make Bill a lot of money, make the, the blackjack a lot of money, make myself a lot of money. And then I take that money and what, what I do is I invest in multifamily apartments. And that's my vehicle that I'm building, that I choose to build on the side that is going to create residual income and long-term passive wealth for myself and my family and my I children love that, that I don't I have love yet. that. I want everyone listening to the show, if you're not already an established like real estate entrepreneur, let's say you're new, you want to get started. I get a lot. I'm sure you get people reach out to you. I get people reach out to me. You know, we get a lot of people, hey, how can I, you know, get mentored by you, whatever the case. And that's great. But a lot of people should realize like, hey, maybe you should be an entrepreneur. Maybe you can start your own wholesaling business if that's what you want to do, if you want to scale it and, and get it automated. But hey, maybe you say, hey, Chad, Greg, whoever, how do I add value to you? How do I help you with your multifamily, Chad, Greg? How do I help you with your marketing? Like, you know what I mean? You could, you could really find yourself in and put yourself in someone else's business, especially if you're new, if you're a brand newbie and you're looking for ways to add value to get successful people to be receptive to you. If you can find a way to solve one of their problems, they will, they will beat a path to your door and they will be more than happy to help you and, and, and teach you things because you're leading with value first. And that's a common theme that I always bring up on this podcast is yep. you need to lead with value, right? You need to do that because when you lead with value, other people will want to reciprocate the value. So Chad, real quick, before we transition into some multifamily stuff, like, you know, obviously you're the director of sales for Blackjack. I actually used to, to train you guys um, on the sales stuff for a while. And I mean, you're an absolute <laughs> rock star when it comes to sales. So what do you kind of do on a daily basis? Cause I know you're not meeting with sellers anymore. You're not physically going out to properties. So what does your overall kind of role look like within blackjack? Because you know, you've, you've really excelled tremendously in that role. And now you guys are in five markets, which is incredible. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm looking at my, I got my journal right here, which is I journal every single one of my days. I know you're big on journaling too. Yeah, so I mean, I can like tell you exactly yeah, what yeah. I'm doing. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, that's probably one of my biggest things is, is journaling every, every day. So, I mean, if I flip through my calendar, my meetings start at 8 a.m. 8 and I'm meeting with my reps. So, you know, on Monday morning, I'll have a sales meeting. Um, Tuesday morning, we have a sales meeting. And then at 9 a.m., I get on with my dispositions guy and we have a same page meeting, make sure that he's disposing of the properties. And we have a game plan for every single property we have under contract. Um, I mean, right now we have 28 properties closing in December. So, oh, you know, we got 28 closings going down, going down in December. Like closings so, on the wholesale or closings on like to acquire and flip? How does that? Close, wholesale closings, like uh, properties that are assigned going to close 28. Goodness. So December's always been a pretty big month. Um, so, you know, I have my, my meetings at 8 a.m. with my sales reps. Those are, you know, we're going over call recordings. I'm breaking down their call recordings, listening to theirs, making sure they're, they're skilled up and they're out in the field, you know, with a, with a real process that we can track and everything like that. And then, you know, nine to 10, I'm, I'm on with um, my dispositions guy. And then, um, you know, in the afternoon from, you know, around lunchtime for the rest of the afternoon is usually some variation of, you know, I'm either listening to call recordings, um, working on our training platform that we do to put reps through so that any new rep that comes on is consistently, you know, they have updated training materials that they're going through. And then um, I'm still involved in a lot of deals too. So whenever deals basically get escalated, if there's issues that get escalated, oh. I mean, that's really where I come into play as kind of the firefighter um, and sort of help meander, with, you know, a buyer and a seller. If we have issues on any of those deals, it's usually my afternoon, but I like to get my meetings done in the morning. So I get all my sales reps, get meet, meet with everybody on my team. Right now I have, uh, again, like I have five sales reps, a, a phone sales rep that's separate, that's not in a market. She's just, all she does is contract properties virtually over the phone. And then I have a dispositions guy. Um, and then the lead intake uh, reports up, up through me as well. So there's um, a few people that I got to get reports from, and I like to get those out in the mornings. And then a lot of, a lot of stuff from those reports give me action items for my afternoon. But 
I'd say my, my mornings are pretty rigid because that's where you want to really get control of your day is, is make sure that the, my morning schedule from when I wake up at 6.30 to really noon is where I have that very rigid schedule. Um, and then in the afternoon, I usually, I'll just take a couple of action items. I call them critical tasks. If you guys follow Andy Frisella, he, he talks about critical tasks. So that afternoon is where I really get my critical tasks done. And those are the things that I know are going to move the needle, right? It's not, that's not a to-do list. It's not responding to emails or anything like that. Critical tasks are things that are, you can do that, you know, are going to move the needle. And I have about four or five of those that I get done every day. Man, you sound just like me. It's scary. Yeah. It's like I'm cloned hey, in Nashville right now. Success leaves clues, man. Listen, man, that's awesome. What is an example of one of your critical tasks? I, I, I'm so big on this stuff, man. I, I could literally talk about this stuff for hours. Like what, just an example. Cause I can, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, I mean, on, on my critical tasks today, I have, uh, I have to break down one of my rep in Pensacola. I have a call queued up that was like a great call that she didn't get. And it's about a 45 minute call. So I know that if I break that, if I break down that call on a zoom, that's going to move the needle for her. Wow. I have, you know, Joshua, who's my new rep in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I have a zoom call with him for one hour to go through his bridge training. And I know that's going to move the needle for him in our business. And then, you know, one of the personal ones is we have a cost segregation study that we're doing on the 14 unit apartment complex we just bought in Clarksville. And I need to get the appraisal over to the cost seg guy and set him up with the property manager. And I know that if I do that, it's going to move the needle. I love so it. Oh, those, are just, those are just three of them. And then the other one I had was ride the bike in the morning. So I, I do a Peloton in the morning and, and then read 20 pages is another one of mine. I love so those it. are the five for the day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just mentioned the cost segregation. So uh, let's transition now into the multifamily thing. So obviously, I think the way we'll handle the multifamily segment of the show is we'll, we'll, let's talk about kind of what your end goal is with multifamily in general. And then I want to break down the deal that we were discussing on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and then we'll, we'll kind of leave everyone uh, at, there and then we'll get some contact information. So what are your goals in multifamily? Cool. I know, I think the way that I even was aware of you doing multifamily. I think when we met in San Diego, like over a year ago, you were talking about some multifamily deal you were in the middle of. And I was like, Oh, dude, you do a multifamily? No kidding. And then you were like, tell, we were talking about it. And then yeah. uh, a year later, obviously we're back on the phone. You tell me about that deal you're doing. So what, what, what are kind of your goals with multifamily within the next five years? Yeah. So, Oh, the next five years. Um, I mean, I have my targets up, you know, I'd like to have 5,000 units in five years. So, I mean, I have my targets up on my board. Um, and I know how exactly how I'm going to get there. So next year, I mean, I want to acquire a property per quarter um, is, is kind of my goal. Right now, my wife and I are invested in passively in 252 units in Jacksonville, Florida. So we own, we're, we're part owners in Limited 252 partners? units. Yeah, yeah, we're just on the LP. Okay. And then we're on the GP. So we own, we just closed on 14 units in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is just, it was a phenomenal deal the way we structured it. Um, but moving forward, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of your listeners, they know the power of multifamily, right? It is truly a wealth creation vehicle from the, the tax implications that you can get, get rid of, the, um, you know, the hedge against inflation, the, the cash flow that you have from these properties, right? The stabilization of this asset class is unparalleled. So when you talk about long-term wealth strategy, I don't know that there's a better vehicle than multifamily apartments. And, you know, there's other, there's other facets to commercial, which can be lucrative, such as retail, you know, industrial and office, but those in my eyes can be easily disrupted. I mean, you look at office and people are moving more to remote jobs. You look at retail and Amazon has been putting Macy's, JCPenney, all those big things out of business. So, you know, there, there's some volatility to the, some of those other facets of commercial versus everybody's always going to need a place to live. Everyone. So like when I look at, when I look at the stable stability of the asset class, I'm like, dude, no matter what people are going to need a place to live. And we are moving into, we are, we are in a renter generation, right? The baby boomers, you know, 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day and they're moving into less of a home ownership rate. The millennials such as you and I are coming out of college and they're not purchasing homes and they're buying homes later in life, if at all. So we're in a, a heavy renter generation. So now is, I mean, you talk about like what, what is going to be around and what's going to be appreciating consistently. And it's, for me, I see it's multifamily apartments. So absolutely, I'd be, no, I'd be I couldn't agree not to more. be in them. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, and especially with the, the thing I like about commercial and multifamily is like, 
your, your ability to manipulate the value of the property is so much better than oh my gosh because like you could just increase the well it's easier said than done but like obviously raise the rent decrease the expenses you've already created the value buy at a cap rate that's you know higher than yeah. the market's trading at there's so many ways to do it um yeah it's just, just it's phenomenal it's unbelievable you know? the forced depreciation is is what you're oh. talking about and it's like you the fact that you know, the fact that an apartment complex is not valued based on the surrounding homes, like a single family home, but it's valued based on the amount of net income that it produces. And if you can, you know, I'm a part of a coaching company for uh, a multifamily, uh, the Jake and Gino wheelbarrow profits community yeah, exactly. and um, great guys. And, great guys. you know, I talk about coaching and mentors. Like that was one of the things when I got really serious, I was like, I got to get in with a coach mentor to help me avoid some potholes. And I actually had, I had, the the property that we closed on two weeks was actually my third property, multifamily property that I had under contract. And my coach shot holes in the first two deals and saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes. So before, you know, when I'm talking to your listeners, before you guys look at a coaching, like a, a, a bill for a coaching company, or like you look at the price for a coaching company, you need to look at that as an investment and not an expense because some people will look at a coaching program and they'll see 10 or $15,000 bill to join this coaching program. And they're like, Oh man, I don't need to pay that much for a coach. But I will tell you that the learning curve, number one. So the amount of time that that will shorten by joining that program and the experience you can gain. And number two, the, the potholes that you can avoid by leveraging other people's mistakes is like, it's, it's almost priceless because I avoided like hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential mistakes because this, my coach had been done so many deals that he knew things that I wasn't seeing. Right. Yeah, and yeah, um, like, yeah, yeah. I, I know I kind of went off on a tangent there, but it's just, oh, I, no, I just want your listeners to know that like, man, having a coach and a mentor, no matter where you are, even the, even, even the greatest coaches, the highest performing athletes all have coaches. So, um, I, I haven't been as bought into coaching as I am. Like this year was like my big year for realizing like you need a coach in every aspect of your life. You should. No, it's true, man. It's like you're buying insight. You're, 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 you're buying condensed knowledge and you're buying absolutely knowledge. You know, it's like, you know, you spend 10, 15,000 on a, you know, coaching program that one investment could, t you know, teach you how to make a hundred thousand. You know what I mean? It's like, what's the return there? You know, you spend 10, mm -hmm. make a hundred, you know, net 90. So um, and then the, the the most important thing before we get into this little case study as we wrap the show up is like, it's almost like you're um, when you're buying coaching or you're buying knowledge like reading or whatever the case is, you're you're almost buying a skill set which you'll have for life because the things you're gonna learn in whatever coaching program or book or training whatever it is that's going to develop your skill, which is going to develop your value to the market, which is always going to, now you're going to have that knowledge in your brain forever. So now, you know, Hey, next time I'm buying a multifamily, I need to look at this thing and having those skills and building those skills along the way, it's going to get you, that's going to get you really going to be the valuable thing. that's going to get you to where you want to go. So, you know, as we wrap the show up, Chad, I want you to do, we'll do a mini, a mini case study dissection on the 14 units that you shared earlier. Um, just so we can kind of put this uh, multifamily thing in like concrete example and then uh, get the listeners all inspired to go do it themselves. So let's uh, let's have you share that little well, not little deal, but that's a, that's a nice size deal. Um, certainly yeah. than five units I'm in the middle of right now. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll we'll share it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, it is. It seems like a little deal now. I Dude, mean, when, when you have deal. these lofty goals, but you got to start somewhere, right? Base and hits a base hit, man. Base hits a base hit, and for your listeners, like if it's a duplex, if it's a quad, whatever, like just get into it and start start building now. Yeah. Um, so the deal was brought to me by a wholesaler, a friend of a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and the moral <laughs> of the story is like, tell people what you want to do, because the only reason the deal came across my desk is because I was out there networking and like telling people what I was doing, what I was interested in meeting with people like, and that, that never would have happened had you not gone out there and gone out on a limb and said, you know, Hey, I I'm, I'm interested in, in apartment buildings. Like, it was just through building relationships. And I mean, I think, you know, and your most of your listeners probably know, but this business is like 90% relationships. Like oh, it is more. heavy, heavy relationships. And the more you build and what you'll find is the people who are doing the most amount of deals, like they all know each other. So like that upper 10% that's doing 80% of the volume, they all know each other. Right. And, um, so anyway, the, the, the deal was, was, 
put in front of my desk. I'm a finance guy. My, my that was my major in college was finance. So like I'm a big numbers guy. So I analyzed it and like, dude, this is a good deal. We had it under contract and I'll just, I'm going to write the numbers out. So I didn't, uh, <laughs> I don't mess them up, but we had it under contract for, uh, 874, 874,000. It's 14 units in Clarksville, Tennessee, 874,000. That's outside of Nashville. It's about an hour outside of Nash. Um, okay. under contract for 874. We, um, we did a walk through the property and found some damage to the, it's a 2012 built property. So the property is almost brand new. It doesn't have a lot of deferred maintenance or anything. It's 2012 built. The owner needed to 1031 his money by the end of the year and get, he had another investment that he needed to, to get into by the end of the year. So he was motivated. Right. And we love motivated sellers. Oh, <laughs> that's where you get the best deals. Talk to. Motivated <laughs> yeah, sellers. That's where, that's where you get the best deals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's tough to find motivated sellers in the multifamily space oh, in this yeah. market condition. All right. The markets, the market's very, very high. It's a seller's market. Um, okay, so when you do find a motivated yeah. seller, you, you're very lucky. Uh, <laughs> So 874, we did a walkthrough and found there was some, some water damage in some of the door frames and some other stuff. We ended up going for a reduction. We asked for a hundred thousand dollar reduction. Um, and he ended up giving us, we ended up getting an, a $90,000 reduction on the oh, property. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. A huge, a huge takeaway there was don't be afraid to ask for more because we were going to go in and ask for 50. And then we decided, wait, let's just ask for a hundred and give, give ourselves some negotiating room. And he gave us 90. So it kind of crazy. Um, you know, we didn't have the intention to, to get a reduction when we put it under contract. The deal did make sense at 874, but the deal was a lot sweeter at 784. Um, oh, yeah. And you no, know, now we knew we had to replace all the door frames and there was some, some drainage issues that we were going to have to fix too. And um, anyway, so we got it under contract really after the reduction, it was 784,000. The key here was the financing because when you are getting started, right, in multifamily, the three pillars are understanding, number one, the exit. So when you're looking at a deal, you need to know how you're going to exit that deal. Okay. It needs to be, all right, is this a long-term hold? Am I refinancing this in three to five years? Am I selling this thing in seven to 10? Like, what is my exit? Okay. And then also what market cycle am I in? Right now we're at the top of a market cycle. So you need to pair your purchase and your exit with where we're at in a market cycle. Because you do not want a note coming due or you do not want your sale, the time you're planning on selling the property to be at a dip in the market. Hmm. And then it's about pairing up your debt with that market cycle. So that was the big piece was because we're at, because we're at a, a peak in the market, when I get debt on this property, I want this debt to be long-term debt because if, if I'm at a peak in the, and, I get a, and I get a five to seven year loan on this property that comes due in five to seven, that thing might come due at the bottom of a cycle. Yeah, then you're and in I, a jam. And, you, and then you're in a jam, especially if it's a value add project, then you're in a big jam. Yeah. So what we did was we got a long, long-term debt on this thing because the exit right here is just hold. We just want to hold this thing. Um, and so we knew we wanted to hold it. We knew we we're at the top of a market, so we need to get long-term debt. Okay. You know, if you're on, if you're in the uptick, that's going to, you're going to try and get a different kind of debt. Right. And if you're, if the market's at the bottom of a market, you, you definitely want to get shorter term debt because you want to refinance when the market gets higher. So, you know, that, and that's all stuff I learned from the coaching company, right? That was stuff I learned from having mentors and coaches in that space, as well as, you know, studying this stuff for 18, 24 months. Um, so anyway, we have it under contract for 784,000. The property just appraised at 950,000. Oh, <laughs> God. So it appraised at 950. Before we closed, we got an appraisal ordered at 950,000. Now here's the kicker. We had to close on this thing with, with hard money because the, um, the, the bank would not loan and the, and the loan we ended up getting was 80% of LTV without a seasoning period. So that's really key there because the seasoning period, if we had to hold this thing for 12 months, we, we're not going to hold it with a hard money loan. That's just, oh. we would have paid out the wazoo and in interest. But we found a bank that would loan to us with no seasoning period, but it had to be in our names. So we did something very, very risky, which I don't recommend unless you have all your ducks in a row, but we actually closed on this property. Somebody loaned us the full purchase price 
I'm sorry, they loaned us, yeah, the full, uh, the full loan amount, which was 760,000. That's 80% of the appraised value. Yeah. So 80% of 950 is 760,000. And we had a lender that loaned us that 760 at a couple points and um, a high interest. And we refinanced out of it two weeks later into, <laughs> into the 80% of LTV. And we are in this deal. Keep in mind, the purchase price is 784. Our loan is 760. Oh, so we're in this deal for $24,000. Dude, that's, yeah. and how long is the note? now for the how long is the mortgage and note for the 20, second two it's a 25 year it's a 25 year note at 5.25 percent there's no there's the, the term is 25 years yeah fully ammed out yeah at 5.25 percent so hell is, it's phenomenal yeah so we um holy we had shit. to talk to a lot of people <laughs> holy shit no, dude we, that, we, those we, terms are phenomenal yeah we talked to it i mean we talked to a ton of people yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day, like we had a lot of people that said, you know, we had Pinnacle lined up to do this deal. And then they, they threw a wrench in it because they said they wanted a 12 month seasoning period. Oh, and we're yeah. like, dude, we can't, we, we can't do it with the 12 month seasoning period. Um, so we had to talk to a lot of banks and ultimately a bank kind of took a chance and said, I mean, clearly this thing's worth 950. It's a safe bet. The only reason some banks didn't want to do it is because we had, we don't have a lot of skin in the game, which I love. But banks don't love that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Sounds like me but when you, rehabs. <laughs> but when you show a bank uh, a building that's appraised at $950,000 that's built in 2012, I mean, like they're going to do that deal. And yeah. um, so after talking to enough banks, I mean, we got someone to pull the trigger on that loan. And now we have $24,000 on the, in the property total. Um, and we're, we're kind of highly leveraged, if I'm being honest. I'm, I, I, got, I don't have a lot of capital in that, but I don't need a big – cash i don't need a ton of cash flow because i only have 24 grand in the deal yeah your so cash, it doesn't, on cash is still good if it my cash on cash is like 28 percent because yeah. even if it doesn't cash flow at all like so it, it's still you know what i mean like the debt the tenants are just going to pay down that debt we're going to hang on to this asset for forever right. yeah and um we got a property management company on it at six percent of the gross it's producing about ten thousand ten thousand uh it's ten thousand and fifty gross a month so we got a property management company on it at 6%. So I'm, we're completely passive in the deal. And then um, God, what else do you guys need to know on it? Man, that's phenomenal. I mean, that's yeah. phenomenal, dude. And the coolest piece is we did a cost segregation study and they're actually finishing the study up this week. And, you know, we did a cost seg study and we're going to accelerate all of the depreciation into year one. It's going to completely wipe out our tax bill for all of our active income. So I made a good amount of money this year and I'm paying zero in taxes because I bought this building. So I actually am wiping out close to a $50,000 tax bill with 24 grand invested. It's saving me $50,000 on my taxes this year. That's a little high. I think it's end up going to be end up like 40 after my expenses, Holy but cow, dude. so um, that's the power of, that's the power of real estate. It's the power of multifamily right there. Um, you know, the ability to, now those deals are not, I, I'm yeah. not getting like, I'm not out in the market looking for these deals because these don't happen often. Yeah. <laughs> just, but, but this is, it's persistence. I mean, this is probably, I've analyzed 80 to hundred properties in the past six months. So I, I know what a good deal is when it comes across my desk. And, you know, this is me putting two other properties under contract and having them fall out. It's me. It, there's a lot of stuff that's invested. I mean, it seems kind of like this fell in my lap. But at the same time, like you got to, you got to account for all the work that you did behind the scenes to get to this point and be able to pull the trigger on this deal because without analyzing hundreds of properties, without walking all the deals that I walked and submitted offers and never got any response back or never, never got the deal with the contracts that we put under and, and did all the due diligence and never happened. We didn't make any money. On, no, nobody made any money on that. And as an entrepreneur, you got to be willing to put in that investment so that you can then, then get to this point. Where you where you get this deal? Absolutely, you got to put the work in, man. I mean, you you know eighty, you, you don't uh, get good at analy analyzing deals by doing ten of them. You did eighty of them, so you knew exactly what you were looking for, and it's like you see those patterns, man. That's mm -hmm. I'm glad we ended with this this little case study because I think this will inspire a lot of people, especially people who are in the flip game, like you and I, who want to get into that multifamily game. It's funny. I mean, you got your fourteen units. I'm like this close to getting a five unit nice. lock with owner financing principal only which would be phenomenal so that's um, sick I'll keep on that but yeah please listen, do man, 
Yeah, dude. Um, well, it's been a lot of fun, man. You have, um, what would be the best way if people like your story, they like, um, like what you're about the best way for people to get in touch with you. I can put this in the show notes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm big on my platforms, Instagram. So Mr. Chad King at Instagram, uh, it's MR and then Chad King, all one word at, at inst- on Instagram. And then I'm on, I'm a Chad King on Facebook. Those are my two platforms that I'm, I'm kind of on getting better at getting on the social side of things. Um, but yeah, just some final thoughts for your listeners. I mean, you guys can, um, you know, you guys can look at the vehicle that we're in and the wholesaling and flipping and Greg does a lot of it. You guys all follow Greg and I'm in the same boat. Like we, we do wholesaling, we flip and that makes us money, right? Oh yeah. But you also have to have a long-term strategy as well. And if your long-term strategy is not going to be to build a sustainable wholesale flipping company on your own, that's going to run itself like Bill Allen did who built this phenomenal company then you need to have a long-term wealth strategy as well because you're not going to get financially free by flipping, flipping houses on your own. And um, again, you can make a lot of money, and, but it's, it's very transactional. So just be, be cognizant of that. You know, unless you're building that, that uh, you know, completely passive vehicle, it's going to be a transactional business. But then use, that, use those profits. Number one, reinvest in yourself first. Number two, reinvest in your business. And then three, invest in assets. Don't buy liabilities. Love it. Chad, man, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming on. I'm sure some people people will be uh, reaching out to you. So thanks for your time as always, man. I hope you have a great of rest of the day. And uh, man, this is going to be a good one, man. People are going to like this. Awesome, man. I had a blast. Thanks, Greg. I'll talk to you soon, man. Good luck with those five units. Thanks, buddy. See you. Talk later. Peace.